Welcome to COIQ, a first-of-its-kind video program about health innovators, early adopters, and influencers, and their stories about riding the roller coaster of healthcare innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy, founder of Legacy DNA Marketing Group, and it's time to raise our COIQ. Welcome back to the show, COIQ listeners. On today's episode, we are going to explore what it takes to successfully commercialize an innovation in healthcare. And I have, from someone who is doing it really well, and I have someone with me here today, Julie Mann. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Roxy. So Julie is the Chief Commercial Officer for Whole On Solutions. And I thought you would be able to, um, you know, start off the conversation by telling us a little bit about your background and what you do. Sure, sure. Well, thanks again for having me. So I would say to start off, I am a customer first person, totally. And um, currently in my role, I lead commercial operations for Holon, which is all the customer facing things. So I would classify myself as being the person in charge of making the magic happen, <laughs> you know, making sure that I'm connecting people that have problems to our solutions that solve them. So I haven't always been in sales. I kind of started my career off um, in a medical billing company where I used to post charges and payments. <laughs> and <laughs> that really served as a really good foundation for kind of where I'm at today. Yeah. And so slowly I evolved into different roles. Um, I then started kind of training customers on how to use revenue cycle management software. Um, the sales team then would uh, tap me to kind of help them with sales presentations and demonstrations. And then from there, I um, kind of got introduced to a full sales role. And I would say the common theme in my career has always been that customer focus, but then also always to work with the most innovative technologies that are on the market. You know, I am by nature curious and yeah. healthcare has tons of problems and there's a lot <laughs> of those technologies out there, right, that just add to those problems. So yeah. I'm attracted to companies that have these kind of breakthrough solutions. And so that's really what landed me at Whole One today. So so thank you for sharing that. It's amazing how all of those lily pads really early on in our career um, really influence and build into what we're doing today when we would have never thought that when we were in that moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, you kind of touched on this a little bit. Describe from your perspective what it's like riding this crazy roller coaster of healthcare innovation today. It's really confusing. You know, I would say that um, for anybody that's in healthcare that's attended some of the big conferences like HIMSS, for example, right? If you are walking through um, the trade show floors, <laughs> right, 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 and um, getting gigantic, you know, it is gigantic, right? And when you just kind of stop and have a casual conversation, right, of being like, so what do you do? It's very seldom that you hear somebody articulate something in the simplest form that you can understand and be like, you got it, right? In most cases, especially in those scenarios where HIMS, you know, has a wide variety of different healthcare technology solutions, not like a niche, you know, audience. Um, it's really interesting, right? So, <laughs> it's like, and you're still like, okay, what do you do though? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like for me, I've always just really been focused on that is like, how can you take something that's super complicated that you know is really innovative, but be able to commercialize it in a way that people are instantly going to get it. You know, mm -hmm. it's not going to be this really 10 paragraph explanation. <laughs> you know, it's like a couple sentences, like that's what we do. And then you can dive in deeper. Yeah. So what are those couple of sentences for you guys? For us, it's hold on liberates the data to liberate the care. I and love that. We love that too. <laughs> and, you know, it was like, um, it's, we do what's really complicated in the back end, right? We have a new way of making data actionable and we can go into that, but fundamentally that's what we do. We liberate the data to liberate the care. And it was a statement that um, my colleague, Robert Conley, kind of just threw out there. You know, we were prepping for a big meeting when, with our prospect at the time, Phillips. Yeah. And he's like, we liberate the data. And I was like, yes, 
That's exactly what we do. And granted, this was at the time when um, one of the Star Wars movies was coming out, right? Uh-huh, so, uh-huh. Like, we're the rebellion, or, you know, right, you right, know, right. We kind of just loosely, like, kind of put it out there as we were putting our presentation together with Phillips. And when we said we liberate the data, it just really resonated with them because the current state that we're in with healthcare, right, is um, data siloed. It's all over Mm -hmm. the place. Mm -hmm. People have made tremendous investments in different kinds of technologies, whether it be their EHR, their HIE, their pop health platforms. And the fundamental problem that they have is they can't make that data actionable because it's locked in these silos, you know? The best solution that people have come up with is like a portal or something like that, but still not out there. So- the word liberate, people get it, you know? Mm-hmm. And as soon as we say we liberate the data, they're like, ooh, we need that. And we're like, yes, <laughs> with a purpose, right? The reason yeah. that we're liberating it is we want to let physicians be physicians. You know, we want nurses to be nurses. We want the care team to feel like they have the right information um, about the patients that they're seeing. And so mm-hmm. it's been really rewarding to kind of come to that. You know, it was kind of quirky how it started but it really speaks to fundamentally what we do. You know, in my experience, the most powerful, um, compelling messaging strategy that we've ever developed for our clients has always been developed in the most strangest ways. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I have a colleague and as soon as she says, okay, this is going to sound really dumb, but, and I'm like, okay, you know, the magic (laughs) is coming. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, you know, you stumble upon these things and it's like, aha. And what I really love about the, you know, this phrase that you just communicated is obviously it's simplicity. Mm -hmm. Um, But as you think about early adopters, you know, just characteristically of early adopters, they're kind of rebels, right? They're looking for like the new, the different, what everybody else isn't doing. And so just that word, that verb liberate, like what early adopter doesn't want to get behind that movement. (laughs) So imagine that it's attracting that early segment of the market in a real powerful way. You know, it really has. And it's allowed us to really kind of cut through, you know, that noise that is, Mm -hmm. that is hymns, that is the healthcare IT space in general. And I think that we're also really focused, right? Like we're not trying to save the world and do everything, right? Like um, the whole reason that we started the company was, you know, we just saw this data problem, right? Like Mm -hmm. it used to be like a paper problem, (laughs) you know, now it's a data problem. And you can't just give people a fire hose of longitudinal data and think that that's going to be actionable. And they're going to read right. through all that text and be like, oh, I just needed to know about who their PCP was, <laughs> right? So that whole thought of being like, let's just be really meaningful, of being focused on solving this very specific problem of being able to service the right information mm-hmm. at the right time. So that's another thing that I think is really fascinating about this whole commercialization process as you're talking about solving a single problem. So Mm -hmm. a lot of times when we're working with health innovators, they might go into it with the intent to solve one problem, but it's like, but we could also solve this and we could solve this and we could solve this for this market and this for this sub market. And so I find that that convolutes the messaging that convolutes the value proposition. And it sounds like that's also something that you've done. That's really been a game changer for you guys is really focusing on a single business problem. It really is. Cause the end of the day, it's like, we are so focused on getting the right mm-hmm. information to the care team Mm-hmm. when they need it, right? Yeah. And so it leads to other things, right? So we did go through an exercise really early on when I joined and coming up with our commercial plan, right? Say, who is our ideal customer profile? And not that that's like a unique strategy, but it's really, really important, right? Mm-hmm. And so understanding like, okay, this is kind of what we can do. Who are the people that, you know, have this problem? You know, you could say all of healthcare, right? Like you could say that we um, narrowed it down to primary markets and we were ultra focused on those primary markets and those primary markets for us are um, health systems and vendors. And Mm -hmm. with each of them, they have the same users, right? It's the people that care, the care teams. And so our messaging is slightly different, right? But Mm -hmm. 
we know we have this focus. And we went through this exercise. The first time we did it um, was really painful, right? Because <laughs> we have strong personalities. That's what makes us a great team, right? So yeah, yeah. Perspectives, and you kind of work through it. <laughs> we do, yeah. Was you know we agreed, right? Like this is our foundational kind of game plan. Like this is who our customer is. This is who it's not. This is who we are, and this is who we're not. And it gave us our marching orders so that as we got into these conversations, because it's pretty common, you know, when we're kind of showing people like what we can do, that they'd be like, oh, can you help me with this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and in the past, right, it would have been so easy. We didn't have those guardrails. We'd be like, sure, why not? Let's try it. And it would. Or we need out. cash flow. Exactly. We, we need cash flow. So let's do it. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so it's also kind of given us that discipline, you know, mm -hmm. to say, listen, we agreed on this. Now there are, every once in a while, right. There will be kind of that anomaly that pops up, but we'll talk about it and be like, okay, like what are the rules that we'll have for this engagement? You know, let's put some bookends if you will. Yeah. Around it. Yeah. And cause you don't want to shut down something really good but it's allowed us to have that foundation that we then built upon. And mm -hmm. so we knew exactly who we were targeting. You know, we knew exactly what problems we were solving for them. And it just made such a better interaction with those customers. So, you know, it seems as though that that is kind of like a no brainer going through the exercise of that targeting strategy and really developing that ideal customer profile. And like you said, not only what you are um, or who is your ideal customer, but also who is who is not your ideal customer customer. Um, but so many people overlook that strategy. <clears throat> um, and what I see happen really often, especially for early stage um, healthcare tech companies, is that if they don't do that work, um, when they're in the pilot phase, they get really excited about it and they've got this new business. And typically those early adopter customers are visionaries. They're, they see the future. That's what motivated them to buy into something that was really brand new. And when they do that, they have all these ideas of what they could do with your solution. Yes. And so yes. how do you determine which one of those are going to be great ideas and they're commercially viable for all of your customers and which one are just the customization that that particular customer is wanting that could derail you and take you off course. Oh, isn't that a good topic? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I can tell you we're going through that with one of our largest ACO customers, right? Uh -huh. and they're fantastic. And one of the reasons that they're so fantastic is mm -hmm. because we're a perfect fit, right? Like we had a piece of technology that they really needed to yeah. solve a problem. And so when you fundamentally have that, right, we didn't force anything, you know, and right. they didn't force anything. It just was going to work, right? It's like, right. okay, cool. Let's, so we're starting from that standpoint. The other thing that really works is transparency and just talking to them, right? So no doubt they would kind of throw some things at us and we tried a couple and some just did not work, right? Yeah. And we were like, hey, you know, we tried it. We went into it with you in the spirit of partnership, but this is where we need to stay focused. Yeah. And yeah. So we just had another conversation, um, I don't know, I want to say like three months ago, and they told us about this really big strategic priority, and we didn't, hadn't known about it, and we're like, well, cool, let's help you with that. <laughs> like, oh, we're like, we can just, our product does that, right? Like, we can help you solve that problem, <laughs> and they were like, oh, you know, so not only was it such a, an aha moment for us, like with them we immediately didn't start, you know, developing everything and, you know, want to commercialize another application. Yep. We tapped several industry experts, you know, consultants, um, analysts, obviously lots of other provider organizations, <clears throat> vendors, and just said, hey, we kind of heard about this. You know, would this be meaningful to you? And Dr. Roxy, consistently, people were like, if you can solve for that. And so when you get that overwhelming reaction, you know you're onto something really good. <laughs> yeah. So I can, we, you know, kind of quickly, and again, since we're like a young, nimble company, we can kind of yeah. put stuff together pretty quickly. And so right. we made an announcement about this new application on our platform. And not only did we just make the new announcement, we also found a couple of customers to do it with, which <laughs> shows you, right, that that innovator, early adopter, when they're like, we've been trying to solve this too. You guys right. can this? Sure. <laughs> You know, and I think that those are the kinds of um, 
markers, if you will, right? That when you kind of are consistently hearing that, you don't just listen to one person, you know, right. you start to, you know, tr throw it out there with a diverse pool and you're getting that consistent feedback. It's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it is really exciting. And so it's really, so it's almost like a, for, a an informal version of um, co-creation with the yes. customers. And yes. so I'm always advocating for co-creation. You know, it's fascinating to me how many um, entrepreneurs um, or companies that want to only innovate, do all of that product development with their internal team and don't tap into the external stakeholders that can really reduce the R&D cost and, and kind of make sure that you're going to go to market with something that's actually going to solve one of their top priority problems, right? Yes. <laughs> and you know, it's funny, even when you say it, it's like, it sounds so obvious. Right. I think like when you get around technologists, especially, right? Like yeah. some of them get so in love mm -hmm. with what they can build, you know, yeah. just the power of it. And it's like, no, no. Right. Like, you have yeah. to design to solve a problem and you have to engage those people that you're solving the problem for. And during that process for us, right? Like we went, we got super excited and it was almost like, it's like, okay, let's rein back in, right? <laughs> like it's focused yeah. in and let's talk to people and not just talk to like, you know, the, the top executives of our right. Client. Um, yep. but engaging throughout their organization mm -hmm. and multiple stakeholders too. Again, not just talking yeah. to one client. And I can tell you, it's so rewarding, right? Like when you actually call people up, right? And I have a lot of favorite clients. You know, my team teases me all the time because they're like, you say that about everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but we are the best clients because if I have a question, I can just call them. And if it doesn't matter if it's like the chief medical officer mm -hmm. or, you know, one of the nurses who's an administrator, you know, yep. it's like they all like want to talk to us because they know that we care. You know, well, and, and that's so, I mean, that's, that's, that's unheard of or not unheard of, but it's rare. Usually it's like, I'm busy. Things yep. are chaotic over here. Don't call me unless yeah. there's a fire. <laughs> yeah. No, well, and it's so awesome because it's like, it's just making it transparent, right? To be like, right. hey, we were talking to so-and-so and they thought about this. Mm -hmm. Would this be meaningful to you? Because yeah. if you think about how a lot of decisions are made in healthcare, right? Like, um, let's just say the C-suite decides that they have this problem and they're like, you know what, we're just going to throw this piece of technology at it and it's going to be solved. Yeah. You know, the end users get it and are like, we're not using that. Right, and then right. three months later, it's like a bust, right? Yeah. So for us to kind of engage throughout organizations and be talking to everybody and make sure that everybody's aligned and then design, you know, the app to meet their workflows and make their workflows better. Yeah. It's so powerful because then people use it, you know, clinician engagement goes up, you know, ROI goes up and like everybody's happy. And yeah. And that's why I feel like I can say those things. Like I love all our customers. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, but um, take us back to like the early days, right? The beginnings of whole on solutions. Um, you know, what, what do you think, what were some of those decisions that you or the organization, you know, the other leaders made that you think were just like, pivotal decisions for you? Like if you hadn't made that, like you didn't re maybe realize it then that it was going to be so impactful, but looking back in hindsight, wow, this was a game changer for us. This was, you know, helped put it set up on a path of success. Yeah. I, I would say that hands down for us, it was picking the best early customers. Mm -hmm. um, not only the people who are like the innovators, right. But the people that truly wanted to go into a relationship with us as partners, understanding that we haven't had everything figured out. You know, we got like right. really smart people that created some like new solutions, to old problems, but there was still going to be some figuring out. And, yeah. you know, I, you hear the term like development partners. I, yeah. I don't really categorize them as that. I really categorize them as early customers. And so we had some absolutely fantastic ones and ones that would work with us and have those conversations, right? Mm -hmm. that, that I was talking to you, not looking to us to be like, they have all the answers. You know, they knew that, okay, here is what we think. 
what do you think? Let's try it out and let's then talk about it. Like what worked, what didn't work? And I think having those relationships was just absolutely key. And at the same time, we walked away from a few relationships, right? That on paper, it was kind of hard, right? Where we had discussions, <laughs> right? Going back to that whole cash flow conversation. Exactly, right? <laughs> right? To be like, that's not going to help us, right? Like, yeah. I don't think that that's going to be something that's going to be a long-term win. It is mm -hmm. going to help a short-term problem. Right, but yeah. I really think that fundamentally choosing the best customers was one of the best decisions we've made. So, you know, kind of take us back to that that moment or that stage, um, you know, was anyone on the team ever concerned about turning down business um, or saying that this was an ideal customer and this one wasn't? And, you know, was there any type of, you know, negotiation internally on <laughs> who those early customers were going to be? Like, you know, what's, I mean, I'd imagine that it's not like everybody's always on the same page of like, this is what we're going to do. Some people are, t you know, typically of like, ah, you know, how could we say no to this? I mean, you nailed it. I mean, I think that that's what I, I love about our team, right? It's like, seldom. is there any decision that is made that everybody's like, yeah, good idea. Right, so right. Fun, you know, so it is having those different perspectives and questioning mm -hmm. like everything, you know, and I appreciate that so much. And I think that's part of the reason that we've been so successful is because we have that culture, right? Where everybody mm -hmm. feels good to be able to kind of jump in and have an opposing view and challenge things because we're all in this together, you know, right. and yeah. um, there were some hard conversations. And I think kind of going back to those initial, that ideal customer profile session that we did was like, remember that, right? <laughs> that opportunity would be called the sandbox. <laughs> we want to stay here. And right, it right. was helpful. You right. know, and it's like, Remember why? yes. And I think especially <laughs> when you start talking about like some big names in healthcare, you know, it's like, um, people just want to have that as a customer and it's like, yeah, but you guys, that w it's not a good deal for us. Right. Oh like, my goodness. It's like you're preaching to the choir here. Like, don't get all woo-woo because, yes. you know, ABC Oompty Oomp Health System said yes. Yep. They could actually be your demise. Yes. They could take your company yes. down. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. You know, totally. the, the bureaucracy, the time, the change yeah. of priorities, you know. And yeah. a lot of times, especially for startup or emergent companies, I'm, all, I'm often recommending that they're looking for the, you know, C-level. C um, of clients, right? Not even the secondary ones, but C level, uh, because they're going to, I found that they're going to be the ones that are more, um, open to that, uh, partnership relationship that you described earlier, where they're not expecting you to have all the answers and they're really wanting to participate in yes. the development of that solution. Yes. Yep. And I can totally see that. And I think that, you know, when we look back at these things, that's everything, right? Those early relationships and um, growing them into even bigger engagements is really, really exciting. And we've certainly experienced that with our, you know, vendor partners um, because it, it's real to them, right? Like they're in a competitive space. They have users that want their stuff to be easier to interact with. And so Holon can be their silent partner. So it makes sense, right? That we're constantly yeah. at the table with them and talking with them. And mm -hmm. there's some really cool things that are going to come out of that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now about not necessarily going to market with products and solutions as much as it is with going to market and creating a category. Mm -hmm. and the market catch up um, and that being a really um, a, a real um, strong strategy for success and that if you're just looking to just build awareness and adoption of your innovation you're only going to in increase you know so far but if you're actually trying to help create a whole category that you know so much thought leadership and authority with that that it kind of snowballs its effectiveness any um you know experience or thoughts around creating a category versus marketing a specific solution it's so interesting that you say that because when we were really kind of coming up with our foundational messaging a couple of years ago, it was hard for people because we are a new solution, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
we don't fit into any one category nicely, right? Right. Because we are surfacing insights into the workflow. We're not an interface vendor. We're not <clears throat> analytics. We're not in HR. And at first, people just want to bucket you into one of these categories. And so we went through this discussion of like, okay, maybe we're this new category. And then we're like, let's not do that. Let's just focus on the problem that we're solving, right? Yep. And just kind of mm-hmm. stay there. And kind of fast forward, you know, to just even a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to, um, I had a series of talking to several analysts. And I talked to Forrester, Gartner, and Frost and Sullivan. Yeah. And in every single one of those conversations, Dr. Roxy, they were like, you guys don't fit into any one category. And they're like, <laughs> we love this. Right. The most useful stuff doesn't. And I was like, oh, cool. Because we think that too. I stopped stressing out about it, you know? Right. And just right. being like, does not apply. I can't tell you how many forms we would fill out where they're like, <laughs> What what category you fit into? And I was like, does not apply. (laughs) Right? Because we don't, but we're solving a problem. Right, right. That's so funny. So, you know, th- th- in my experience, it's one of the pitfalls because, you know, it's, n- it's a natural in a lot of ways for us to want to fit in one of those boxes. But yep. then there becomes this disconnect of how are we going out to the marketplace and saying we're unique and different. <laughs> right. We're wanting to attract these revolutionary uh, early adopters, but, but we're like this. Yeah, it's like, well, now you just basically, you know, ruined everything else you were saying because now all of a sudden I'm putting you in the old box and you're not exciting and new and different anymore. Yeah. 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 And I love that you say that because again, that was another one of those kind of decisions, right? Where it was like a lot of stress and I'd be like, maybe I'm thinking about this wrong. You know, (laughs) we're like, you know what? No, we're just going to lead with this, right? We're not going to spend all this time creating this category or whatever. Right, right, like, right. We just focus on what the clients need to be successful, mm-hmm. and I'm so happy that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what number employee were you? Because I think you were you were one of the earlier, or you were there, you know, in some of the beginning stages, right? Yeah. So, um, hold on. The the solution that we have today, we just commercially launched mm-hmm. it in January of 2018. 18. And I say that I'm like, Oh my gosh, that was like, mm-hmm. in so many ways, it seems like yesterday. And then it seems like many years. In this right, 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 right. And so with that, yeah, I was part of the team, right. That was brought in to commercialize, you know, the solution, which is awesome and exciting. Mm-hmm. And so very early on, mm-hmm. we um, are in growth mode right now. And we are going to be, you know, <clears throat> expanding our team, which is really, really exciting. And so I think it's been really rewarding to be an early member of the team and kind of go through kind of that stage and just know that there's so many other great things ahead of us. Well, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that you're the chief commercial officer. Mm -hmm. And that is a title that I often find in much larger, mature organizations. Mm -hmm. So I think that I, I... you know, as someone being on the outside looking in, I would say that that's probably um, one of the most important decisions that the CEO or the leader, whoever hired you made was Mm -hmm. bringing someone of your caliber um, Mm -hmm. to kind of fulfill that role that Mm -hmm. early. I don't see that happen very often. They're thinking like, oh, well, when we get to this, that's when we'll bring someone at that level in. But at that point, all of those commercialization decisions are mostly already Already made, yeah. and and so bringing you in early, um, I would assume had a big impact on the business. <laughs> I, I think so, you know. And I think like when I, it was very clear to the team, um, you know, they told me that they knew exactly kind of what they were getting with me, right? So they were really focused on kind of picking me mm-hmm. because they felt like I could kind of help them out. Yeah. And, I had that walking into it, you know, so I knew that I had the confidence of the whole team Mm -hmm. and that everybody was going to be very open, collaborative and honest with me. Um, And I can also tell you that when I first started, they kind of thought I would just be over sales and helping kind of commercialize from that perspective. Ah, very quickly it changed. <laughs> and, you know, very quickly, I think, like right, three right. months, right? It was yeah. like, it's like no, there's all this value we can't pass up. Right. And it's almost like when you're early stage of that, right, too, uh, from me, I wouldn't have been able to 
been able to do it if I was super siloed. I needed right. to be able to interact with all the client facing components of the business, right? Because, you know, going to clients and listening to them and then, you know, talking to prospects that have problems and then talking to our implementation team or, you know, all of those things were allowed me to kind of lead our strategy um, as a member of the team. Um, but it's been very rewarding and I couldn't mm-hmm. be happier. So how do you, um, you know, how do you think that the early structure of the organization and culture of the organization is playing a role in your success? I think that it is critical to our success. You know, I think that um, the culture at Whole On truly is, it's, it's a team effort. You know, no one thinks that it's, you know, one person driving everything. And I feel like kind of having that culture of we're all in this together and also this openness, right? Of mm-hmm. everything's not always rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's good to kind of constantly be bringing feedback back and um, talk through those things. And I think that culture is so special. And we've tried to also kind of put that out there because a lot of companies don't kind of have that. And, you know, it's awesome with all the tools available today, right? Like we're huge on Twitter, you know, we love LinkedIn, we do blogs and we try to post pictures of different Mm -hmm. things, you know, like outside of just the professional stuff that Holon's doing, you know, some fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so cool because I'm always talking to a prospect and, um, I wrote a blog about the Revolutionary War and I used the term liberate, you know, and she was like, I was reading that and I was wondering how you're going to tie that back to liberating data. She goes, I loved it. And <laughs> it just set the stage for such a nice conversation, right? Because she felt like she already knew me a little bit and she already knew like, you know, the vibe at Holon and what we were trying to do. And she's like, yeah. listen, this is where we're at. And it was like, we we're already on the partnership discussion sure, you know? sure. <laughs> over that getting to know each other thing a little bit more. And so I think as we grow, you know, we've been very intentional to try to keep that, you know, spirit out there so that people can kind of see, Hey, this is what whole on's all about. There's no surprises. Um, and I think that's really important. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm so happy for you guys. Um, so you all, so you just kind of touched on something else that I think is really interesting is the power and the equalizer of social media. So, you yeah. know, that, that idea is not necessarily new, right? Social media has been around for a long time, but I think especially in healthcare and for a startup, you know, again, that whole social media thing is kind of like, okay, when we get to a certain size, then we'll hire someone to kind of manage our social media. So it's kind of like a afterthought or like a longer term strategy. And there's such a huge opportunity that's missed um, yeah. if we overlook that or wait for that for later for the, all the reasons that you're just talking about. Um, you know, when you're talking about boots on the ground and trying to connect with people, right, with phone calls or emails or knocking on doors, it can, especially with a cold prospect, I mean, oh my gosh, it can take forever. Yeah. And, but then you can have that, that encounter that, that unsolicited encounter on digital and just open the door wide yeah. open. Yeah. And you know what? I feel like so many healthcare companies aren't doing it. You mm-hmm. know, I've been a fan of it forever. I had a friend, Gabe, he's amazing. He set me up on this like maybe five years ago. I kid you not. Uh-huh. He called me the other day. He was like, I love what you're doing. I'm always following you on Twitter. And I said, I know it's so powerful. And that's what I love about it is you can pull like the topics that are important to you and you can kind right. of like, cut through the noise. Yeah. And so for whole on, that's been a big deal. You know, we do hashtag liberate the data and that's boom, awesome. you get all our stuff. And right, right. it's like, you know, it's fun to put it out there, but we've made some really, really great connections. You know, I got introduced to this woman by the name Janae Sharp. And she does the uh, Sharp Index, which is dedicated to reducing physician burnout, which mm. is such a great ally for Holon, right? Yeah. So it, kind of, it brought us together and we've done really cool things and we have a couple other things planned, but we've met so many people like that through the use of social media. And it's almost like a modern day, like newsletter, <laughs> you <Right>. know, <laughs> you think about like, you know, back in the day you would mail out, you know, like a 
slick to somebody and whatever. Right. How do you do that today? Right. Those ones up in the garbage can. You know, right. with Twitter, and we don't like, have to have their email address. <laughs> yes, exactly. And yeah. it's exponential. And you can also like, it's, it's just really cool. And it's a way to engage with people and in the market and um, just stay current and what's going on. Mm-hmm. So what, what recommendations or advice do you have for those listeners, those health innovators right now that are in the trenches that are really struggling um, for, for one reason or another, you know, what, what recommendations do you have for them? I would best sum it up probably by a lot of the topics, you know, that we, we touched on. I mm-hmm. would say you've got to start and you have to be focused, right? So you got yeah. to really have a problem that you're solving if you're not solving a meaningful problem, like forget about it, just stop. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right. So assuming you have a really great problem um, and, or I should say you have a tough problem, you have a really great solution to that problem. Yeah. You want to go yeah. through that rigor of identifying who your ideal customer is. Right. And then you have to stay disciplined with focusing on that. And I think once you kind of have those things, the rest will kind of fall into place, you know, and um, having those early customers, right, that are going to look at you as a true partner and you're in it together and you're getting feedback and support from them. I think that those things combined are really um, what struggling organizations should look at first. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today with all of our listeners and with me. I appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you so much. This has been so fun. (laughs) Absolutely. All right. Well, until next time. Okay, bye. Bye. What's the difference between launching and commercializing a healthcare innovation? Many people will launch a new product. Few will commercialize it. To learn the difference between launch and commercialization and to watch past episodes of the show, head to our video show page at drroxy.com. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the show. You can subscribe to the latest episodes on your favorite podcast app like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, or subscribe to the video episodes on our YouTube channel. No matter the platform, just search COIQ with Dr. Roxy. Until next time, let's raise our COIQ.